The objectives of today's talk are to evaluate the role of CTCs for drug development in treatment selection, therapeutic monitoring, and identification of novel targets in breast cancer. Why do we care about molecular profiling in breast cancer? I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but I would like to talk about a common clinical scenario seen in breast cancer. A 55-year-old female was diagnosed with hormone receptor positive breast cancer in 2005. She completed five years of adjuvant tamoxifen therapy. In 2012, she had disease recurrence in the bone. Letrozole was started. Six months later, she had disease progression. Which therapy should we choose next? A common question is, is the tumor still ER positive? Because it is known that in about 10% of cases, the tumor has a switch where it becomes ER negative. Does the tumor have an actionable mutation? Or does the tumor have multiple mutations and amplifications, suggesting that combination of targeted therapies would be helpful? If you look at the NCCN guidelines, the NCCN guidelines would list these therapies, various endocrine therapies, chemotherapies, and biological therapies for hormone receptor positive metastatic breast cancer. And there are multiple clinical trial options as well. One could target IGFR, HER2, PI3 kinase, AKT, mTOR, CDK4-6, and even the estrogen receptor. Indeed, studies have shown that even upon progression to aromatase inhibitor, the tumor still has ER that is viable and could be subjected to targeted therapies. Similar to prostate cancer, there is now an interest in developing selective estrogen receptor degraders. In other words, drugs that bind to the estrogen receptor and degrade the estrogen receptor. We've been involved in a phase one clinical trial of a drug ARN810, which is a selective estrogen receptor degrader and would be presenting the preliminary results at San Antonio this year. We have observed some preliminary evidence of activity, particularly for tumors that are ER positive and have subset of ESR1 mutations. In addition to the estrogen receptor, there's interest in CDK4-6 and mTOR. Yes, we're talking about triple combination, triple combination of endocrine therapy with mTOR, with CDK4-6, so you can effectively shut down the growth factor pathway. A clinical trial is ongoing, which is looking at the combination of AI plus Everolimus plus CDK4-6 inhibitor, and preliminary evidence of activity has been observed. Molecular profiling of a patient who had a good response to this triple therapy, in other words, had stable disease for more than six months, demonstrated that the tumor had P16 deletion, cyclin D1 amplification, and IGFR1 amplification, highlighting the role of combination of targeted therapy that is needed for response in that patient. Indeed, there are multiple ongoing genotype-driven clinical trials. And a common clinical issue is the availability of tissue. Tissue is an issue for hormone receptor-positive breast cancer. And this is because in a large number of patients, the site of disease is the bone. And it's very difficult to do bone biopsies. Often, the tissue is limited both in quantity and in quality. And that is where CTCs can have a role. CTCs can serve as liquid biopsies. One can obtain repeated non-invasive specimens. One could potentially do molecular profiling and monitor tumor biology and evolution over time. However, this is technically challenging. CTCs represent a rare population, less than 10 cells per ml compared to 1 million white blood cells per ml. Dr. Daniel Haber and his lab, in collaboration with Mehmet Toner, 
has developed a CTC I chip, which allows for tumor antigen independent sorting. And what that means is that it allows for isolation of circulating tumor cells that are released in a solution that is relatively untouched. So these are CTCs that have not been subjected to any manipulation, and you can use these purified CTCs for sophisticated molecular analysis. It is possible to do deep sequencing from these breast CTCs, and an example is shown here. In addition, one can look at the cytopathology of the breast CTCs to look at the estrogen receptor, the progesterone receptor, the HER2 receptor, and this is a distinct advantage of CTCs over circulating DNA where we cannot look at cytopathology. And perhaps, most importantly, one could use CTCs for developing ex vivo cultures. So one could culture CTCs from patients in an artificial media. Recently, our group demonstrated that it is feasible to get CTCs from patients with metastatic breast cancer and actually culture them in an artificial media. As seen on the left, these are CTC cultures derived from six patients with metastatic breast cancer. These were then used to derive patient-derived xenografts or PDX models from CTCs, and the CTC-derived cells and cultures shared histological characteristics that were similar to the matched primary tissue. The CTC cultures were then subjected to deep sequencing, and the deep sequencing identified multiple acquired mutations that were not present in the primary tumor. In particular, this led to the rediscovery of ESR1 mutations, which were not present in the primary tumor, but were seen in the circulating tumor cell cultures. As this manuscript was being written, multiple other groups reported ESR1 mutations in the fall of 2013. And ESR mutations are important because mutations in the, lig in the ligand binding domain of the estrogen receptor results in a conformational change which allows for ligand independent activity of ER. In other words, the tumor becomes estrogen independent. And when the tumor is estrogen independent, it would not respond to standard endocrine therapy like aromatase inhibitors. Moreover, preclinical models have shown that these tumors do not respond to other endocrine therapies like tamoxifen or fulvestrant. So in other words, currently we do not have any standard therapy for tumors that harbor ESR1 mutations. We then investigated potential targeted therapies that could work for this subtype. So in a patient, BRX68, who had ESR1 mutation in the CTC culture, we observed that there was no response to targeted therapy in, in the form of standard endocrine therapy. So if you look on the left, that is a heat map that represents cell viability. Red would indicate that the CTC cell lines are resistant to the drug. Blue would indicate that the cell lines are responsive to the drug. So as you can see, the cell lines were resistant to fulvestrant and raloxifene, which are standard endocrine agents for breast cancer, but responded to HSP inhibitor STA9090 alone, as well as in combination with endocrine agents. And when we looked at the amount of ER positive cells that were present, the ER positive cells were 60 to 70% when standard therapy was used. But when that was combined with HSP inhibitor, the percentage of ER positive cells decreased dramatically with the combination, suggesting that the combination of endocrine therapy plus HSP inhibitors could potentially work for tumors that harbor ESR1 mutations. But is this cl clinically meaningful? Can we translate the results that have been observed in the lab to the clinic? So we uh, plotted a time graph 
to as to when the CTC cultures were obtained to the time that the patient had disease progression. And as you can see, that approximately a month before the patient had disease progression, it was possible to isolate CTCs and use them for uh, forming cultures. Thus, there is a clinical window for drug susceptibility testing that can be applied in the clinic. It's also interesting to note that this patient, again, BRX68, who had an ESR1 mutation, did not respond clinically to fulvestrant, which is anticipated because this patient had an ESR1 mutation. One would anticipate that this patient would not respond to fulvestrant. So what was seen in the lab was also seen in the clinic. In another example, patient BRX07, the CTC cultures were subjected to sequencing and PIK3CA and FGFR2 mutations were identified in the CTC cultures. Combination of various drugs were used to identify potential synergistic combinations. We found that this CTC culture was particularly sensitive to a combination of PIK3CA and FGFR2 inhibition, which was consistent with what was seen in the genotype. Interestingly, the tumor was also susceptible to PIK3CA plus IGFR inhibition. We then generated patient-derived xenografts from the CTCs and found that a combination of PIK3CA plus FGFR inhibitor was also successful in tumor xenografts. It led to tumor uh, regression, so validated what was seen in the cell lines in tumor xenograft experiments as well. Thus, to summarize, molecular profiling of CTCs can be used for immunostain, fish, sequencing, and cell cultures, which can be used for determining choice of therapy, monitoring therapeutic response, determining mechanism of resistance, and identification of novel targets for drug development in breast cancer. It is possible in the future CTCs would become standard for the management of hormone receptor positive breast cancer. We have a patient with ER positive metastatic breast cancer in the clinic would have routine CTC evaluation and molecular profiling. If we detect that the tumor is ER positive with no actionable or driver mutations, one could consider endocrine therapy. If ESR1 mutation is seen, one could consider novel selective estrogen degraders or combination with HSP inhibitors. If PIK3C mutation is seen, PI3 kinase inhibitors can be used. If HER2 amplification is seen, anti-HER2 therapies can be used. And if complex mutations are seen, then one can use combination of target therapies or use the CTC culture results to uh, base their clinical decision. Obviously, this needs clinical validation and clinical studies to validate these concepts are ongoing in breast cancer. I would like to thank the CTC team, in particularly Dr. Haber and Shamala Mahiswaran, my mentors, Dr. Chabner, the breast team, the study staff, funding sources, and gratitude to my patients. Thank you. Have there been any studies done comparing uh, circulating cells with exosomes, like how different information they can provide, and which one of them is easier to, to retrieve from the blood? So that's a good point. And, uh, there is a lot of discussion about the role of CTCs versus circulating DNA versus mRNA and other techniques. Ultimately, we need a comprehensive test. And the nice thing about using the iChip for CTCs is that it not only allows genotyping, but also characterization of the receptors like ER, PR. You can potentially do cultures as well. So it becomes your one-stop shop, if you will, to look at various things that are important uh, in clinical care. In the development of some of the agents that you showed, similar results have been seen in model systems, combinations with, uh, et cetera, that um, actually um, showed activity in the human treatment setting, but not real sufficient um, clinical benefit leading to like FDA approval. 
So my question has to, uh, is, uh, is the, do, uh, do you have consideration for the kind of magnitude of effect and, and perhaps positive controls that really correlate better with like survival benefit or the kind of, um, <clears throat> of um, you know, d disease free survival magnitude that is now being um, advocated in the breast cancer community before we add more drugs or more combinations to, uh, you know, to, to the, the group of approved drugs? So that's a good question. The question is comparing the preclinical results with clinical results and what significance, uh, what is the magnitude that would be considered significant in breast cancer? So related to the first question, it's, I absolutely agree that many a times we see exciting things in the lab which necessarily do not translate into the clinic. So in particular related to CTC cultures, we are doing parallel experiments in the sense if we see something in the CTC cultures, we are trying to map that to what is happening in the clinic with that patient with similar drugs. In CTC cultures, we can test multiple drugs because these cells are growing and so we are trying to match the exact drugs that the patient is receiving in the clinic to that in the ex vivo models. So see if we can collaborate what makes sense and what does not. So that process is ongoing. In terms of what is considered clinically significant, um, that's a good question. Um, the clinical significance in hormone receptor positive breast cancer would be different as compared to triple negative breast cancer. ASCO released a guideline uh, about six months ago which talked about what should be clinically significant for different types of subcancers. So as we move forward, it would be important to do trials that not only demonstrate a statistically significant benefit, but also a benefit that is clinically meaningful.